Dr. Grotheis, before we start talking about specific thinkers, could you explain in a nutshell for our audience, what is philosophy? Philosophy is basically the study of reality. Philosophy asks questions like, what is the meaning of life? Where did we come from? What is our destiny? So the art of philosophy is really thinking critically about the ultimate issues in life, or the way the Greeks put it was, what is the good life, or what is a life that is happy, meaning what is a life in which you live to your fullest and contribute to the common good. But philosophical questions are not unique to the Greeks. Human beings ask where they came from and how to live. It's really intrinsic to being a human being, but to be philosophical is to look at those questions through reason, to ask good questions, to be clear, and to use arguments that move from premise to conclusion in a correct way. With whom of the ancient Greeks uh, should we begin our discussion of Western philosophy, and what uh, circumstances have contributed to its beginning? Well, there's a group of philosophers known as the pre-Socratics. They came before Socrates. There are a number of them. Uh, Thales is considered, in many ways, the first philosopher we know of. And Thales was interested in nature. He was interested in uh, philosophy. At that point, the interest uh, was the same. Someone was just a seeker of truth. So he was concerned about the patterns of nature and the ultimate substance of things. In fact, Thales said the ultimate reality was water. A actually, everything comes from water and through water. And the pre-Socratics were trying to find the one reality that explained all of reality. Uh, so for Heraclitus, it was flux. Everything changes. You can't step into the same river twice. But then Heraclitus had an idea that there was something beneath the flux, which he called the logos, which was constant. So these thinkers are not thinkers to rely on the mythologies of the day. They wanted to not just consider stories that entrance people. Uh, they wanted to find intellectual answers. Now, another group of philosophers uh, that would be pre-Socratic were known as the Sophists. Uh, uh, some scholars have claimed that they gave the philosophy uh, a bad name. So what were their views and their methods that will fit that characterization? Well, the term sophist has come to mean someone who is basically a hired gun intellectually, uh, someone who can make a bad case look good. Uh, Protagoras uh, was a sophist philosopher. He's the one who said that man is the measure of all things. I don't think all of them were mere intellectual mercenaries, but they gained the reputation of making a case for a patron, whether or not that patron's view was right or wrong. So we often say if reasoning is sophistical, it's somehow biased or prejudiced or has a vested interest. So that goes back to the sophists or sophists. Now you mentioned Protagoras, and uh, you have written a chapter uh, on him uh, in his in your book uh, uh, Philosophy in Seven Senses, and uh, and what did he mean when he said, "Man is the measure of all things"? Protagoras was what we call a relativist. He thought that we couldn't talk about objective reality, mind independent reality. Uh, the mind, in fact, created reality. So we measure things, whether they're beautiful or ugly, whether they're good or evil, whether they're a virtue or a vice. So mm -hmm. the issue is not, is our measurement correct against a standard? The idea is that our measuring is all that we have. Now, various thinkers have taken him to task, including contemporary uh, Socrates, who said, well, Protagoras claims to be a teacher. He's trying to give us truth and lead us away from error. But if man is the measure of all things, there's really no distinction between truth and error. Mm -hmm. It's all dependent on an individual's viewpoint. So if Protagoras's view is right, that everything is relative, mm -hmm. man is the nature of all things, then he couldn't be a teacher in the sense of leading someone into truth and putting aside ignorance. Mm -hmm. Moreover, 
there are some strong moral consequences to this because there are people who take murder and torture to be right for them. Mm -hmm. I think of uh, the serial killer Ted Bundy who justified his many murders in the United States uh, 30, 40 years ago because there was no objective morality that he was accountable to. So he was one of the wise, strong ones who could uh, abuse women and murder them, and he murdered dozens of women. So if your philosophy allows for a Ted Bundy or allows for an Adolf Hitler because that's their view of things, then there's something radically wrong with that philosophy. Now certainly, there is subjectivity in the world, and we respond differently to different questions and different stimuli, but there is a truth that we can get to about God and the meaning of life, uh, basic right and wrong, and so on. Sure, it may be the case that in one room of 70 degrees, one person feels cold, one for person feels hot, someone else feels just right, but that's uh, not an ultimate issue. That's a subjective condition of the body in how we respond to it. So he took a partial truth and tried to inflate it to cover all of reality, and it just doesn't work that way. Now, how different is the Christian perspective from Protagoras? In other words, who would be the measure of all things according to the Christian worldview? Well, certainly the creator, designer of the world would be the measure of all things because he brought all things into existence out of nothing. He designed everything in the universe and the universe as a whole. It has a purpose. It has a goal. It has meaning because God gave it meaning. There's meaning to history, meaning to the human condition. So we should try to think God's thoughts after him, so to speak. And God has revealed truth to us, the most important truths in Scripture. So we want to be careful not to be subjective in interpreting the Scripture. Sometimes people will say, well, this Bible verse means this to me. The issue should be, what does it mean, period? And then how does it apply to me or apply to you or apply to someone else? So uh, we have in Christianity, obviously, truths about God. Uh, God is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's revealed that in the Scripture. He has come to earth in the person of Christ. And Jesus said, you're with me or against me. So there's a great either-or. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't say, well, Jesus is whoever you want him to be. You have to deal with him as he is. And then I also think of the summary of the moral law and the Ten Commandments. These are absolute imperatives that were given. Uh, it's not, here's a style of life you may want to try if it fits you. So Christianity is not a relativistic worldview at all. Now, Socrates was a contemporary of Protagoras, at least at some point or uh, for a period of, uh, of time. And, but he was a very different kind of thinker uh, who positioned himself against the sophists. Uh, or at the sophist way of doing philosophy. Um, we use his name, as you mentioned before, as a reference to divide the uh, Western philosophy, pre-Socratic and post-Socratic area. Uh, what was so special about Socrates? He was a philosopher through and through. He was what they call a gadfly of Athens. He would wander around and engage people in conversations about issues like what is the good life, what is justice, how do we determine what is good. So Socrates didn't seem to have any vested interests. He was not a person who would give an argument because you paid him to give an argument like the sophists. Mm. And he was a remarkable questioner. Uh, he was able to elicit answers, or in many cases elicit the ignorance of people. People would think they knew what justice is, and then once he started asking them more and more questions, they realized they didn't know what justice was. So Socrates didn't write anything that we know of. We get our knowledge of Socrates mostly from Plato. But you find these dialogues where uh, Socrates is dealing with the ultimate issues of life without fear and without pretense. Uh, he was not an impeccable person mm. by any means, but 
Many consider him to be a, a paragon of philosophy, and he also uh, died. He was put to death basically for being a philosopher. He was accused of corrupting the youth of Athens and advocating strange gods. And he was told that he could uh, leave the area, be banished, and never come back to Athens and escape the death sentence. But he decided he wanted to stay and be loyal to his state. So in a sense, he was a philosophical martyr. One of Socrates' most known phrases is uh, when he said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Mm -hmm. And uh, what should we take away from this sentence or this phrase? Well, it's a bit of an overstatement because while everyone asks philosophical questions, I think, at some level, not everyone can be a philosopher at the level of a Socrates. But what he's saying is that human beings have the ability to reason and to ponder issues of life and death and eternity, and so they should take advantage of that ability to think carefully and critically about these issues of what is the good life, is there a God, is there an afterlife. And so he thinks that critically engaging life is essential to a good life, and I think he's correct about that. It's fascinating to see that uh, he had the option when he was in prison to uh, to leave the, his philosophic or his life of doing philosophy and do something else, and he chose death instead. So he kind of lived that phrase in his life. You would say that? I think so. Yeah, I think he was a consummate thinker, and he wanted to stay true to his principles until the end. Do you think that the phrase, the unexamined life is not worth living, is compatible with the Christian thought? It's roughly compatible. What I would appeal to is Jesus' statement, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So that's a theological statement, and it involves love. So it's deeper than what Socrates said. It's related to God, our Creator. It's uttered by Jesus, who is our Savior. And he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love God with your heart, soul, strength, and mind. So to love God with your mind is to be open to what God has revealed, to think carefully, to think critically. And Jesus himself was a model of critical thinking and robust argumentation, mm. as we see in the Gospels. So what Jesus said, I think, assumes that people should think carefully and critically, but he puts it into a theistic worldview, and actually he is at the very center of that view because he is God incarnate. Now, Socrates' most talented uh, student was undoubtedly Plato, and about whom the 20th century philosopher and mathematician Alfred North Whitehead memorably said, I'll read this, the safest of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. Do you think that's a correct evaluation? Well, it's certainly arresting and memorable. I think it's right in that Plato was a systematic philosopher. He dealt with all the great issues in metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, aesthetics, and so on. And we have a great body of work that he left us, and he raises the great questions of what is the relationship of matter to spirit? Do we have a soul? How do you cultivate the good life individually and in the polis, in the larger social whole. So I think in one way or another, Plato inf should inform the way we think about philosophical questions. We may not necessarily refer to him, but we might. Like if we're talking about an immaterial world of ideas, mm -hmm. something that exists outside of matter, mm -hmm. then we're talking about something that Plato articulated mm -hmm. at length in his writings. Mm -hmm. Or if we're talking about uh, how to order a society, we'd probably refer to some of Plato's ideas in the Republic, or at least it would be in the background somewhere. Mm. We're talking about the immaterial objects. Uh, one of the most known uh, concepts of Plato is uh, the theory of forms, uh, also known as the theory of ideas. Uh, can you explain what this theory is and how it compares with the Christian worldview? 
That's a big question. Plato believed that there was more to reality than nature, what we can see, touch, and taste. And he was trying to make sense of the order in nature. And he believed that there's order in nature because nature is grounded in something beyond it, in something supernatural. So the reason there are determinative things uh, like human beings and trees and things is that they're types of a of a original form, so to speak. So the forms are basically the structure of the things that show up in the material world. And the ultimate form, and these forms are immaterial and eternal and changeless, the ultimate form is the form of the good. So Plato believed that goodness was not relative and contingent upon individuals' views or society's views, that there was a absolute realm, an unchanging realm, of forms. And we find knowledge not by empirical research or consulting the senses, that can only give us opinion, he thought, but by reflecting rationally on ideas. Now, Christians can agree, obviously, that there is more to the world than nature. There is a supernatural dimension. Uh, we as Christians, of course, see God at the center of that supernatural world, uh, the, tri the triune God who acts, who creates the world and intervenes in the world to show himself. Plato did not uh, believe in a creation out of nothing. He did speak of God, uh, but there was not a clear understanding of the relationship of the form of the good and God, whereas in Christianity we understand that God is the personal source of all that is good. It's in his unchangeable character. And Plato had no doctrine of the goodness of the created world. A Platonist wants to escape the world and to go back into this spiritual realm of the forms. And the body, according to Plato and Platonists, is like a prison. And biblically, if you look at Psalm 139 and also look at Genesis 1, God made us with bodies. He breathed his spirit upon the dust in Genesis 2. And the first human being came into existence. Christ himself, of course, took on human nature. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and made the Father known. That's in John chapter 1. So we have some overlap between Platonism and the Christian view. In fact, in Ponce by Blaise Pascal, he has a note to himself which says, uh, use Plato in order to move people towards Christ. Mm -hmm. Just a very small sentence, and I mm -hmm. summarized it. I didn't quote it verbatim. But you can see what he means because if someone is a materialist, they think all that exists is nature without any supernature. Uh, there's no world beyond the world of what could be empirically discerned, then they can't take Christ to be God incarnate because they don't believe there is a supernatural God. There are no gods at all. So I can see how aspects of Platonism can be a kind of bridge into Christianity. And when you look at someone like St. Augustine, uh, Augustine was in a way a Platonist or a Neoplatonist, but uh, he had a higher regard, obviously, for the material universe, and he believed that God was the basis of all that is good and true, and so on. And he believed in the revelation, the propositional revelation in the Bible. So uh, what he's trying to do is glean the good things, the true things, from Platonism and Neoplatonism, but keep a biblical worldview at the center of it. And we can debate how well he did that. I think overall uh, he did a good job. For example, he said that the forms that Plato talked about mm. were actually thoughts in God's mind. Mm. So God is the ultimate archetype, if you will, for everything that comes into being, his mind, and then he actualizes that through his will. And one of the problems with Platonism is that there's no clear relationship between the forms and then how they are expressed in the world, in the material world. And there is in Christianity because God knows exactly what he's going to create before he creates it. And then he brings it into being.
creation ex nihilo. And as a personal being, a relational being, he continues to interact with the world by sending prophets and inspiring scripture and coordinating world events to bring about his desired end. Uh, now, throughout the history of philosophy has been thinkers, skeptics, uh, such as Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, um, who have blamed, in a sense, Socrates and Plato that they had prepared the way for Christianity. Uh, now, do you think Nietzsche was right first? And if so, uh, in what sense did Socrates and Plato prepare the way for the Christian faith? Mm -hmm. Well, as I mentioned, there's overlap between a generally Platonic worldview and a Christian worldview, although there are tremendous differences, as I just mentioned. But uh, Socrates can be read as being a monotheist. He did talk about the gods in the plural, but he seemed to be dedicated to one supreme God, and that's certainly compatible with the Old Testament, New Testament understanding of God. There's one God, one creator, and Lord over the universe. Socrates was passionate to find truth, objective truth through reason, and Nietzsche was not really concerned about that. He didn't seem to be. He thought things were reducible to relative subjective perspectives, and uh, in his own philosophy he seemed to say, if truth doesn't fit my will to power and significance, then so much for the truth. So I think that he may be right in some ways that uh, Socrates and Plato helped build a bridge to some ideas in Christianity. And of course, he's the consummate hater of Christianity. Uh, he thinks that it's anti-natural, for example. Now that's a case where Platonism is anti-natural because you should flee the body to attain to a spiritual level. But in Christianity, the body is highly prized, as I just mentioned, because God created the universe and said it was good created human beings, said they were very good, and were made in God's image and likeness. Christ comes as a human being. So while Christianity certainly teaches that there is a supernatural realm, that God is an infinite personal spirit who acts in the world, it doesn't demean the material world at all. In fact, the final consummation is referred to in Revelation 21 and 22 as the new heavens and the new earth. So it's not disembodied. It's very much embodied with resurrected human beings. Now I want to ask another question in this relation between Platonism and Christianity. Haven't Christian teachings been too Platonized at certain points in the history of the Church? Uh, consider, for example, the monastic theology. Uh, like Plato, the monastics seems to have been thinking that the, bad, uh, the body is bad in some, in some extent, and the spirit is the one who is good. So if this is the case, uh, shouldn't we avoid studying Plato as Christians? Well, even if Platonism has corrupted Christianity in some ways, it would still be good to study Plato, so you can see the difference between his thought and biblical thought. I wouldn't say that, that Plato really gives us something that's lacking in a biblical worldview. I think some aspects of Platonism are compatible with Christianity, and Plato makes some arguments that we can use in apologetics, perhaps, for there being an immaterial realm, and so on. So yes, uh, the battle is always going to be to retain a distinctively Christian theology and worldview as Christians interact with Aristotle and Plato and Descartes and everybody else. So any time that Christians don't rightly honor the worth of the body uh, or who view the afterlife as strictly disembodied, uh, no place for a resurrected body. Uh, they're succumbing to Platonism in some way, and that's certainly wrong. But we should be able to sift what is good and what is not in these philosophies. And then, uh, as James Orr said, bring those scattered portions of truth in the other worldview where they belong into the Christian worldview. Now, the best student of Plato was 
surely Aristotle. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he was the one who took on the task of philosophizing in Athens. Uh, however, in his writing we find that uh, his epistemology and his metaphysics is very different from the, those of his teacher. Uh, so could you explain those differences that exist between the two? Well, I could explain a little bit. Plato thought that knowledge came through introspection, if you will. It came through reflecting on our soul. And the material world was untrustworthy to gain knowledge. All he could have would be opinion. And Aristotle took the natural world much more seriously. He was really a natural scientist, a kind of early biologist. And he thought that our knowledge came through the senses. We don't have any knowledge by virtue of having a soul. There are no innate ideas that we simply have by virtue of being human. All the ideas we have, all the knowledge we have, comes through the world of the senses. And he was very concerned to understand the nature of the physical world. Aristotle also believed that everything had a telos or a purpose. So he worked with this idea of potential and actuality. So things like an obvious example would be an acorn has the potential to be planted and become an oak tree. So it has a telos, a direction, a purpose to it. And in fact, human beings have essences and have a purpose in the world. Aristotle said that we are uh, rational beings, the rational animal, and we are political animals. So to be rational, we need to use our reason wisely to get along with other people in the polis. So Aristotle was a much more this-worldly kind of philosopher than Plato was. Dr. Grutheis, uh, what did Aristotle mean when he wrote, all men by nature desire to know? Yes, that was the first sentence of his book, Metaphysics. And he realizes that people have a desire to understand the world. I think that goes beyond merely the functional. How do I get enough food? Or how do I have a family? But what's the meaning of things? Is there a purpose to life? We desire to know those things, who we are, what the good society is. Now, certainly, we would add, given the Christian view of the fall and human selfishness, that we also have this tendency to suppress the truth in unrighteousness, as Paul puts it. But in our better moments, we want to know the way the world is, and we want to act in accordance with the way the world is. And this takes certain virtues. It doesn't just immediately come to you. And Aristotle was a student of the human condition, a student of society. So in my book, Philosophy in Seven Sentences, I take that as one of the sentences to reflect on. Because I think it's true, it's a bit one-sided perhaps, because Aristotle didn't have the scripture to tell him about the fallen nature of human beings, although he was fallen and everybody he knew was fallen. But you might say, at our best, we do desire to know. And if we do, then there are certain disciplines and certain activities that are necessary to pursue the most important truths. A couple centuries later, we arrived at a man known as Augustine of Hippo. Could you tell us a little bit, who was Augustine? Yes, he was born in 354 AD in northern Africa. He was a very bright young man. He was raised in a Christian home. The biggest influence was uh, his very devout mother. But he was, as he would put it later, quite arrogant. He was very intelligent. He excelled in rhetoric, and he left behind his upbringing as a Christian and uh, lived a sensual life, a life of someone who was intellectually quite successful. And he investigated various philosophies, one of which was Manichaeanism, which is a very dualistic philosophy. Uh, to oversimplify, that spirit is good and matter is bad. But Augustine became uh, disenchanted with that philosophy over a period of time. He was exposed to Christian teaching, but he had a hard time giving up his life of pleasure, especially erotic pleasure. And he's famous for saying, Lord, give me chastity, but not yet. Uh, and then he had an experience where he was 
outside and he heard a little child chanting, take up and read, take up and read. And he opened the Bible to a particular passage which talked about putting off sensuality and sexual sin and embracing Christ. And that arrangement, conjunction of circumstances, brought him to the place of submitting to Christ. And he was in his 30s at the time, so he was an adult convert. And he was the first great systematic Christian philosopher and theologian in the West. So just about everyone has heard of St. Augustine, whether you blame him uh, for everything bad in the world or whether you think he was an inspiration. And one of uh, the most known books that uh, he wrote was The Confessions. One will find there an integration of uh, philosophical analysis mm -hmm. and also a biographical dimension. Uh, do you think that is necessary to explain his philosophy? I think it works well with his philosophy because he had a very intellectual conversion and as a Christian he thought back on the philosophies he once held and wanted to refute them, wanted to develop a thoroughly Christian philosophy of life. For example, uh, he uses his own experiences to speak of Christian doctrines. There's a famous case of when uh, Augustine was a young man and he and his friends stole some pears and they stole them just for the fun of it. They didn't need the pears they simply wanted to do mischief. And he later reflects on that and realizes that that's really the heart of sin, that it was an act of rebellion. Uh, they knew it was wrong and they did it merely for a, a cheap kind of titillation. Mm. So Augustine believes that sin goes all the way down into our souls, into our being, mm. and it takes a radical solution, that is Christ himself, to forgive us and reorient our lives. When I teach that in Intro to Ethics classes, uh, the students will often think that he was just ridiculous because he was a kid and they stole some pears. And it doesn't matter because the pears didn't cost that much money probably. And uh, they probably wouldn't do it when they got older, etc. And they missed the whole point. The whole point is that there is a radical self-centeredness and selfishness in being a human being. And this event, when properly reflected upon, brings that out. So I don't think he uses his own life in a wasteful way, the way so many modern autobiographies do or memoirs do. I think everything in there relates to his desire to be fully converted to Christ and to lead others into a Christian way of life and a Christian mindset. And in that sense, uh, telling an episode of uh, how he uh, experienced sin in his life, it's central to his philosophical mm -hmm. ideas uh, to explain right. to the others. Well, the book truly is a series of confessions. It's a prayer. He's talking to God through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that was not just a device he used mm -hmm. for literary effect. Uh, he was sincere about that. Mm -hmm. One of his... Uh, famous phrases is that when he said, uh, restless is our heart until it rests in you. What did he mean by that? Well, that was something he experienced. He couldn't find peace in his heart. He couldn't find the right way to live uh, before he came to Christ. And he believed that we're not truly fulfilled or satisfied until we are reconciled with our Creator through the work of Christ. And this is really the essence of an approach in apologetics, uh, which is sometimes called the argument from desire or the argument from emptiness. Uh, Pascal has been summarized as saying, there's a God-shaped vacuum in every person that only God can fill. That's a paraphrase of a longer quote that he gave. But this is important to Augustine's whole perspective, that Christianity is not simply a set of ideas about reality. It has to do with the living God who made us for himself. And that's another part of the quote uh, where Augustine says, you've made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. So if the essential relationship that we were meant for is broken by sin, 
then all of our other relationships and all of our thinking will be warped in some way or another. And if that alienation from God is healed through the work of Christ, which we receive by faith, then everything else changes. And it doesn't mean there's no more longing or disappointment in life, but at the most profound level, uh, we can know that we are beloved of God. And we're also given a perspective on life that fits the facts and gives meaning to all that we do. Now, for the sake of time, I'm uh, skipping many medieval thinkers and uh, moving on to the modern area of philosophy, uh, namely with René Descartes. Uh, now, Descartes has been considered as the father of modern philosophy. However, he also has been labeled sometime as a, simply as a skeptic who, at some point, uh, he was not even sure about even he exists, and then, and then he finds out that he thinks, and therefore he exists. Uh, what would be a better categorization of Descartes? Well, Descartes was an intellectual adventurer. He was trying to find certainty during a time of skepticism and where the intellectual world was somewhat unsettled after the Reformation and in light of pagan skepticism having been revived. And he realized there are things that he learned in his education that he found out were false. So he's trying to find an unshakable foundation for knowledge. So what he does in the first meditation of his book, The Meditations, is to try to doubt everything. This is called methodological doubt or hyperbolic doubt. Uh, do I even have a body? Is there an external world? Maybe I'm dreaming and I'm not even awake. So he lays out this vast, uh, this vast array of things that he can doubt. And then he asks, well, what could I not doubt? Is there anything that has to be the case, that has to be true? And he says, well, whatever I'm doing, thinking, doubting, willing, there's someone there. So if I'm thinking in whatever mode of thinking, there has to be a thinker. So we have that statement, I think, therefore I am. Or it's sometimes in his writings, I think, comma, I exist. Not I think that I exist, but I think I exist. So if you think, you exist. And he thinks that that's the foundation to get out of this abyss of skepticism. So he finds in his mind the concept of God, a perfect, unlimited being. And he has a very traditional definition of God. He finds that in his mind. And he says, where could that have come from? I couldn't be the source of it because I'm limited and imperfect. It couldn't come from anything in my experience because my experience is made up of things that are contingent and finite. And I'm thinking of an infinite, and perfect being. So he says, it must be that God himself gave me the idea of God because only God would be metaphysically equipped to put that idea in my tiny finite mind when nothing in my experience could give me that idea. And this is sometimes called the causal argument. So he believes that since he has this exalted notion of this perfect being, that it must be God who put it there, therefore God exists. And then he has another argument called the ontological argument that he gives as well. It's a little more complicated. So this idea is not taken seriously by a lot of philosophers today. I do take it seriously in my treatment of it in my book, Philosophy in Seven Sentences. I think it's at least worth pondering and considering because the idea of a monotheistic God is utterly unlike anything in our world of experience. Yeah. So it raises the question of how could I even have that idea? Could I explain that idea merely by combining various categories of my experience as a limited, finite, contingent being? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that you can. So it gets to the idea of God and he says, God must exist because God gave me the idea of God. And if God is a perfect being and he's unlimited, then he would be perfectly good. So if I seem to see a world external to myself of rocks and chairs and streams, and if I seem to have a body, 
then God wouldn't deceive me about that kind of a thing because mm -hmm. he would exist and he wouldn't be a deceiver. So Descartes argues from the inside out. Mm -hmm. He says, maybe everything outside of me is an, illu an illusion, but I am here as a thinker, and then I take an inventory of my thoughts. I have this idea of God. God put it there. That God would not be a deceiver, and then he gets the external world of events and things and processes, and he gets his own body back, so to speak, mm. and then he's off and running. Mm. Now, how successful was he? Did he really doubt everything? He didn't seem to doubt certain principles of causation. Mm. For example, you have to have some idea of causation to use if you think that God caused you to have the idea of God, and he lays that out. So, how successful was the program? There are some gaps and mm. limits. But he's often dismissed without treating him with enough respect. Um, I don't go into it too much in my book, but he's also famous for arguing that there's a dualism between mind and body. And those arguments are worth taking seriously as well. And a biblical view of the person is that we are a mind and a body, that we have a spirit or a mind, and we're also certainly embodied beings. So we might be able to find some argumentative help from Descartes in uh, making the biblical case. Not to say that his view is perfectly biblical, but again, there's some material to glean, I think, from him. Yeah, as I said, every philosophical idea would have uh, its limits, but uh, would he be successful uh, in making the case that, for example, the scientism that we know today, which will claim that the only way to know things will be through the experience and experiments. Uh, if Descartes' method is right, will it succeed in refuting what scientism claims? Well, inasmuch as there's any a priori knowledge, anything we know simply by reflecting on our own minds, that would make scientism false. Because scientism claims that knowledge only comes through scientific endeavors, and that means empirical observation, empirical theorizing. Mm -hmm. Now the problem with scientism, or one of its many problems, is that it refutes itself because the statement knowledge only comes through scientific means is not a conclusion of science. It's a principle of epistemology and it's a very poor one because it can't support itself. So if Descartes comes up with any knowledge without scientific methods then he's refuted scientism in that way. Although we don't need Descartes to refute scientism. <laughs> it's kind of like the icing on the cake, I guess. Now, I'm aware that your doctoral dissertation was on the French philosopher and mathematician, Blaise Pascal, uh, uh, for which you have a chapter in your book, and uh, you also write there that he has been a long-time mentor and muse uh, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. I discovered Blaise Pascal early on after my conversion, I think it was 1977, when I started reading Pascal. And I found him to be quite insightful and stimulating, especially on his views about the human condition, that we are both great because made in God's image and also uh, miserable, uh, wretched because of the fall, because of our turning against God and against ourselves and against each other. So throughout my teaching and writing, I've referred to Pascal, quoted him many times in my books, articles, public speaking. Uh, I have a small book called On Pascal that I'm revising and expanding now. He's a very engaging philosopher. He was an excellent writer, and he had the human touch. He was able to describe things in ways that were memorable, that focused on the, the foibles and the greatness of human beings. Mm -hmm. So I found him to be very helpful in a number of areas of philosophy and apologetics. Now when we think of reason, we naturally think only of our intelligence. Uh, now Pascal wrote that the heart has its own reasons that the mind doesn't understand. Uh, could you explain what he meant by that? Yes, he's well known for that statement that 
The heart has reasons that reason knows nothing of. Now, he was not pitting reason against emotion or rationality against irrationality. What he's saying is quite sophisticated, and that is that there are various ways of knowing the world. One way is through what he called reason, and what he means there is more calculation. How do premises lead to a conclusion? Uh, what do we observe in the external world? He was a scientist and he designed experiments, so he would use reason to try to verify or falsify a hypothesis. But by the heart, he means more intuitive knowledge, or what some philosophers today call basic beliefs. So it's not that they're irrational or that they would contradict anything we would know through what he calls reason, but rather that we have within us what he called first principles of knowledge. Certain ideas concerning mathematics and morality and so on. And he believes also that God could move directly in our hearts through an intuition. And he says that people who are impressed in that way by God are quite blessed and they do truly have a knowledge of God but he also thinks that we can use our reason at least to some extent to argue for the truth of Christianity and one of his most powerful arguments is what could be called the anthropological argument that human beings are great by virtue of being made in God's image and miserable because of the fall and we are as it were deposed royalty and other philosophy, philosophies either exalt greatness at the expense of misery or exalt misery at the, at the expense of greatness. And he says that Christianity finds the balance and also has the solution in the person of Jesus who came to rescue us and save the lost mm -hmm. and to forgive us of our sin and reinstate us through his work on the cross and through the resurrection. So uh, Pascal was a genius in terms of his scientific work, his uh, philosophizing, and uh, he also wrote on theology and the provincial letters and so on. So I found him an ongoing inspiration for my thinking over 40 years now. So when he wrote that phrase, he was not talking about two people who fall in love and losing the ability to reason <laughs> and just follow their heart. No. <laughs> Another repeated theme in Pascal's uh, writings, uh, when she develops in his book Pensée, uh, was the topic of diversion. Uh, what do you find in his writings on this topic that is worthy of our study? Well, I mentioned earlier that Pascal had the human touch in his writing. He was able to observe uh, the idiosyncrasies of being a human and he was able to identify certain actions and get to the heart of those actions. So he said that a lot of our activities are engaged in in order to divert ourselves. We don't want to think about death or decay. Uh, we become bored easily, so we divert ourselves. Even kings, he says, who have pretty much everything they could want will get bored unless they're entertained at the court. And he says, why is that? If we were perfectly happy with our state, we wouldn't need to be diverted. We would simply enjoy and uh, absorb the world. But he says that uh, the chief problem with human beings is they can't stay in a room by themselves for very long. That is, they're antsy, they're fidgety, they're restless. And so uh, if they are brought to boredom, then they might think about the shortness of their life. They might think about uh, their bad conscience and so on, so they'd rather be diverted by something. Now, Pascal is not saying that all diversion is wrong. If you know uh, what diversion is and how it can turn you away from the truth, then certainly you can be diverted from things for periods of time. What Pascal's worried about is when diversion becomes a way of life because you're running from God. You're running from the truth of your own condition as a needy creature who will die, who needs eternal life mm -hmm. through Christ. So he would rather uh, for us to be bored and search for the meaning than find uh, ourselves in right. something that will... Exactly. 
And I think his words are necessary for us today when we are very easily distracted, when we multitask on several technological devices at the same time, when we can be diverted uh, at any time, at any place, as long as we can plug into something. There's really a place to be quiet before the Lord in prayer and simply uh, catch up with ourselves and remember our Creator and not simply take in endless data all the time without finding the meaning of any of it. I want to discuss one last philosopher, uh, and that is uh, Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish uh, melancholic philosopher. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about his life, short but productive? Yes, he was born in 1813 in Denmark. He was brought up in a Lutheran family, devout family. He was a very brilliant young man uh, who pursued religious instruction, but he never became a pastor. He was a full-time writer. He was not a professor. Uh, he was a very melancholic soul. He had a romance that never worked out that pretty much haunted him for the rest of his life. And he dedicated himself to writing. And his basic purpose through all the different genres that he wrote in was to defend Christianity. But it was not the way that, that I tend to defend Christianity in terms of arguing for God's existence and mm. the reliability of the Bible and the claims and credentials of Jesus. Kierkegaard was in a setting where most everyone was Lutheran. So they would believe basic Christian doctrines. Uh, Kierkegaard's concern was that people were not truly Christians. They had not taken those truths as their own. They had not owned them. Mm. So his concern was to try to open people up to the gospel, to show them that they were needy, mm. that they may be avoiding God even in their religiosity. So when I was a young man in 1976, I was 19, I read one of his books called, uh, the, Sick, called um, the Sickness Unto Death. It's a very negative kind of title, but it's all about despair. And to cut to the chase of it, unless we know Christ as Lord and Savior, the one who gives us meaning in life, we're actually in despair in one way or another. We may hide it from ourselves, but we're fleeing God. Uh, and we have various psychological means to do that. And in that book, he explains various ways that people try to avoid God and end up in some kind of despair. It's very detailed. But what he did for me those many years ago is basically explain me to myself. And my despair basically was a form of despair of uh, not wanting there to be a God, really more like Nietzsche. Uh, I didn't want there to be a God because God would get in my way and God would frustrate me. And I knew that not believing in God or not following God would make life difficult, but I thought, well, that's just what the rugged person has to do. And reading Nietzsche, and given a number of other experiences and things I was reading, showed me that that was utterly foolish. Mm. And in fact, God could take away that despair mm. and uh, restore me and redeem me, mm. which uh, is what he did mm. those many years ago. So I have a, a warm place in my heart for Kierkegaard because of his kind of existential apologetic, that is, trying to assess the human person and how the gospel uh, should encounter a person in all of his subjectivity and all of his rebellion. But uh, Kierkegaard's concept of faith is something that I critique because his view of faith was was more like a leap than a step. I think faith in Christianity, faith in Christ, is, is a step in the right direction. It's not a leap in the dark. Yeah, I'll come back to that. But uh, I want to ask the question, uh, although he said that uh, truth is subjectivity, yet he positioned himself uh, not as a relativist, but as an objectivist, if we would mm -hmm. say that. So what did he mean by subjectivity yeah. then? Well, when he says truth is subjectivity, he, has to, he is addressing how we should respond to the truth. 
So he's not saying that truth is only a matter of your own opinion or your own feelings, your own subjectivity, but given what Christianity claims about God's work for us in Christ and the call to repent, that's not something we say, yes, I affirm that, period, and then you go on with your life as if nothing happened. So it has to do with what he called the passion of inwardness. So if Christ has a claim on our lives as our Lord, then we should follow him and we should reflect on what he says and what he has done and who he is. So he was what we call a realist. He believed the Christian doctrines were true to facts. They were objectively true. But what he didn't like is a notion of objectivity that didn't involve passion and didn't involve a great desire for God. So he didn't deny any of the classic Christian doctrines, but he wanted people to respond to them in true faith, a biblical faith. And I think he overstated a number of things. Faith certainly involves commitment, but I think it's a rational commitment or it should be a rational commitment. He sometimes makes it sound that uh, it's, it's always uncertain and you get over the hump by a sheer act of will. I don't think that's a biblical view. So, as, as you already mentioned, uh, it appears that Kierkegaard did not have a high view of reason when it comes to knowing truths about God. Rather, it, he is famous uh, for endorsing the leap of faith, uh, as you said. Uh, was Kierkegaard a fideist? Uh, in other words, did he think that faith and reason are incompatible with each other? Well, it's a hard question to answer because of several reasons. One, he wrote a tremendous amount. Two, he wrote in various genres from different viewpoints. Um, that's enough, those two, to, <laughs> to make it somewhat difficult mm. to answer the question. But he did say things like, anyone who defends Christianity is Judas number two. <laughs> so that certainly makes it sound like there's no room for reason to defend mm. the items of faith. But he was, in a sense, an apologist that was using more psychological tools than philosophical tools. He was not one to give a cosmological argument or a design argument for God. He thought that was pointless. You simply need to help people come to the God who they know is there. Uh, the problem is not that we don't have an awareness of God. The problem is that we are fleeing from God. We're trying to avoid God. So. He does certainly sound like a fideist in many places, and in my own apologetic, I include a lot of resources from reason that he would not, like arguments for the reliability of the New Testament and so on. I think those are real issues that we need to address. He was focused more on the, the hardness of heart of a religious people who were, for some reason, for various reasons, not taking their religion seriously enough and mm -hmm. through his writings he wanted to spark mm -hmm. a serious concern for Christ and the gospel. A concluding question that I would like to ask is that in what ways can the study of the history of philosophy uh, benefit a Christian? I think it can benefit a Christian in a number of ways. One, as we look at the thinking of different philosophers we can compare what they said about God and human beings and ethics with what the Bible says. And that can help clarify the difference between a, a non-Christian philosophy and a Christian philosophy. Uh, comparison is the mother of clarity, so to speak. We can also find areas of common grace, that is where Christian uh, Christians can find truth in non-Christian philosophers. We've talked about that with respect to Plato mm. and so on. And then also, this is very significant for apologetics because uh, let's say someone is a follower of Nietzsche and they think that Nietzsche's refuted Christianity. Mm. Well, if you know something about Nietzsche and you realize that his arguments against Christianity are very poor, mm. then you can use that mm. in what's called negative apologetics, show the weaknesses in Nietzsche's philosophy, and then that person who was interested in Nietzsche uh, might become more interested in a Christian perspective and a Christian mm. way of life. Now, not everyone is going to have the time or the ability to study the history of philosophy. But if you're in a position to read, study, and think, 
I think there are those benefits and, and others mm-hmm. that can simply help sharpen your critical skills, your critical analysis of ideas, and can mm-hmm. bring that to the scripture, not to take it apart or refute it, but simply ask a lot of good intellectual questions of scripture. In light of what we have talked today, uh, what is something that uh, our audience, uh, you would like them to take away from uh, our discussion? Well, throughout the history of Christianity, Christians have defended what they believe as true and rational and meaningful. And Christians today, whether in Albania or the U.S. or anywhere else, should rise to that challenge. We should have a reason for the hope that is within us. We shouldn't be afraid of non-Christian philosophies. We should be able to, with the Holy Spirit helping us, think better than the world, outthink the world for Christ. So in as much as we have the ability and the time and the opportunity, we should enter the world of ideas. And if there's a challenge to Christianity from Marxism or from Nietzsche or from Freud or from postmodernism or whatever, uh, we should engage that. We should take that seriously and consider the arguments and give better arguments for the truth of the Christian worldview and the wisdom of the Christian way of being. And what if the, uh, some of the audience will be not Christian, so what would you say to them? I'd say take the claims of Christianity seriously. They're very profound, all-encompassing claims about entering into a new way of life. Jesus said that uh, he who believed in him would go from death to life, that by believing in the work of Christ, naming him as Lord, you are born again of eternal life, a new quality of life, a life that never ends. Or you could lose that by not following Christ. You could never gain that wonderful gift of love that Christ came to give us. So I would say to the person who is not yet a follower of Christ to consider the claims of the Bible, consider what it means existentially, consider what it means philosophically, and to pursue that. And my experience now of having been a Christian for 43 years is that Christianity is a coherent worldview. It matches the facts. It gives meaning. And it holds up. I don't have all the answers, but uh, the Christian perspective on the world has given me uh, the intellectual courage Mm -hmm. to write and debate and talk to unbelievers and to teach in many settings now for all these years. And so My testimony is that Christ is, in fact, Lord, and that uh, the Scripture is true and should guide our lives. And this is a matter of great consequence. We're not just talking about meaning and value in this life, but we're talking about eternity. Dr. Grutheis, it has been my pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you.